Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now in today's video I'm going to be finishing off the back plate regrinding as I started and I'm also going to be taking a look at the geometry of the lathe camlock nose system. Now a couple of things from last time. First of all the audience got their first glimpse of my house steward Jefferson. He came in during the middle of one of my setups and he was a natural on camera, well received by the audience and you never know in future setups he may appear with a cup of tea, glass of sherry or perhaps to answer the telephone. Moving on, the caption competition. There were many comments to pick from. I have read all of them and I have picked a winner. Now this is typically a channel for family viewing however on this occasion I have decided to make an exception and the winner is as follows. So if you would like to leave your email address in the comments, I will get in touch with you regarding your prize. Anyway, moving on, let's start some engineering. Picking up where I left off, I had just finished regrinding this back face and the taper of the three-jaw chuck back plate. And what I will do towards the end of this video is mount this on the lathe spindle and then regrind this back face to get this all nice and uh, true. While the four jaw is still on the lathe, however, I am going to make use of these blocks I have attached to the face plate and I'm going to regrind the taper and face of this. Now, so far, I have focused mainly on the setup and a bit on the grinding of these pieces. What I'm going to do here is use this one as an opportunity to go into a bit more detail on how I get the gauge to fit properly. So, I have to grind a taper and a face to make contact with both faces of the gauge simultaneously so I'll go into a bit more detail on the method for getting that to um, all happen. Axial run out within roughly 20 microns. Radial run out within about 10 microns. 25.4 microns being a thou. Ready for action. Now in the case of say the three jaw chuck back plate, I had that much wear in the taper that I had no real option but to grind the taper first and then work to that. Were I to actually write a method for how to do this however, I would do it along the lines of what I'm hoping to demonstrate here, which is to grind the face first and then grind the taper to match the face. Doing it this way round gives me a lot more control when it comes to the finer, finer elements of controlling the taper size, and hopefully you'll see that as I uh, progress. But to begin with, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take a light skim on this face, just until I clean the whole thing up. Then I'm going to take a measurement with a depth micrometer from this circle back to this face. And I'm then going to proceed to grind 0.2 of a millimetre, roughly 8 thou, off this face. Upon doing that, I will then change wheels to my tapered finer wheel, redress it, and I will then begin work on the taper. But first up, I'm going to grind this face back.
something's not quite right because it's looking a bit too shiny. When you are dealing with ground surfaces there's a difference between something looking ground and something looking polished. And um, she's looking a little polished. And I think it, yeah, let me show you a close up of the wheel. Yes, yes, it's exactly as I thought. Part of the wheel has become loaded. You can see here to about here, the wheel is actually loaded, in other words, a bit clogged, I think, by the layer of residue and oil that was on the face. So I will readjust the wheel and try again. The surface is now 0.2 of a millimetre further back and uh, I'm happy with the overall grinding. It looks nice and ground, not too polished and I've maintained the crisscross which tells me the spindle orientation is good and providing me with a flat surface. I am now swapping for this fine little um, aluminium oxide wheel that's got the taper on it. I will be installing this and then I will redress it with a single point diamond and following that I will of course turn my attentions to the bore. got the wheel there with a blotter either side, spacers either side and then the nut on the front. So a torque of approximately that. Right, a surface free from debris to begin with and what I'm going to do is attempt to just remove these high spots and try the gauge. So in terms of depth positioning I'm going to come all the way in just until I touch on. Zero the readout and back off a bit and let's uh, see if I can just grind that tapered diameter ever so slightly. Right, you can see by the shiny reflection just down here that I have just started to touch on that surface and the moment of truth is now upon us. So with a quickly cleaned gauge, I will offer the two up and just let the tapered surfaces glide in. Okay, and I think I like the look of what I can see because I can see a small gap all around this face which is what I was after. So let's get a uh, set of feeler gauges and find out how big that gap is. Let's try 8 thou. 
too much. Let's try six thou. Okay. So I'd hazard a guess it's probably about seven thou. Right, so what is this method? Well basically the face is in its finished position and what I have now established is that with the bore as it currently is sized I have a gap in this direction of 7 thou ish between the two faces. That means in terms of my machining all I need to do is come back in to my carriage position where I took this cup and feed in an extra 7 thou. That is a much simpler method than say trying to calculate the radial infeed required for that amount of shift along that axis and it's also simpler than um, having taken the bore to size and then trying to find the face position to suit. So this is the method I wanted to show. Take the face back beyond where it's required, clean the bore up, measure the gap and now just feed the wheel in purely in this axis the required amount to close that gap up. I will say take 5 thou off and then recheck the gap and this to me is the most precise way out of the available options of seeing where the gauges are actually interacting. So um, I did zero the digital readout in the z-axis um, at that cutting position so I will return to there and go in another 5 thou. Hopefully that made sense. All I've done is move the wheel in the z-axis and having done that uh, by an amount of just over 5,000 let's see what remaining gap I now have. fleece under the overcoat is to cut down on the electric bill. Alright, that's one and a half thou. Not in there. Just about there. Okay, so the gauge isn't in quite square. But I would say we're within the, the realms of less than a thou to go. Ideally, I want to be able to um, hand position this in and for there to be no gap rather than uh, you know, tapping it in. Um, so I'm just going to take, just take half a thou and uh, recheck. So very simple procedure. I just bring the wheel back in to where I zeroed off and feed in another half thou in that direction only. I have taken the last half a thou off quite a few times now. So let's see if this is any better. Right, well I quite like the feel of that because however hard I push, it doesn't bind up. Which tells me that the face is preventing it from going any further. <clears throat> right, I think I'm about there.
All three pieces have now been subjected to a taper and face regrind, and two things remain for this video, both of which are going to be carried out using the three jaw chuck back plate. First of all, I'm going to see how the geometry I have ground in the back plate matches the geometry I have ground on the spindle nose. So I've installed the pegs to allow me to put this on the lathe and have a look. And secondly, once I get this on the lathe, I will be re-grinding the back face here, which interacts with the three jaw chuck body. So everything is nice and clean. And I'm now going to offer the two up and hopefully show you how this system is designed to work. So I have very lightly snugged all six cams. I'm now going to take a one thou feeler gauge and offer it up to the gap in between these two faces. And apart from where that cutout is, you can see that as I rotate the spindle round, another cut out, there is a gap that exists all the way around in between these two faces. Now what I'll do is I will fully tighten the cams all the way around. and re-inspection with the feeler gauge now shows that there is no gap. So what did this little demonstration just show? Well basically it showed the operation of a camlock spindle nose and the phrase to be familiar with here is dual surface contact. As some of you will be aware as the pieces come together, both the taper and the face end up in contact. The bit to be clear on, however, though, is that as this happens, the contact is not simultaneous. Instead, first of all, the tapers come together, and second of all, the faces come together. To put a bit more detail behind this, as the tapers come together, they reach a natural resting position where there is still a small gap between the faces. As the cams then draw in that direction, the female taper is stretched slightly over the male taper until the faces come hard against each other. What does this mean for the overall work holding setup? Well it means that the tapers are hard against each other, giving good radial alignment and providing a good solid centre to resist any machining forces in the radial direction. Also, the faces coming hard against each other gives good axial alignment and provides a wider support, again, to resist machining forces. Part two of the demonstration is to release these cams and see does the piece just fall off or is the interference between the tapers enough to make it hang on. That's it, all released. And you can see that that is well and truly on there. A light mallet tap should release it. Off it comes. Freshly dressed wheel and I'm about ready to go. Now earlier I obviously chose to demonstrate how grease on the face can load the wheel up. So I've given this one a good clean. Um, just a little care point. I'll show a close up at the end but the corner relief groove on this chuck back plate is actually very small. So a freshly dressed wheel with a nice sharp corner is vital such that you get into the groove. Now this is coming in here. <coughs> Make sure I'm not in contact with the diameter. I'm not going to grind the diameter because that is a very snug fit within the chuck body. 
and on these bigger chucks when you start getting mallets and things involved um, any play between the diameters can allow the chuck body to move so even though this band may be slightly off I would rather take the error out by grinding the jaws than grinding this band because I want this to still be a good fit within the chuck body so it's purely a back face grind just to correct any alignment errors okay <laughs> Having finished at the lathe here are a few close-ups, this is the back plate face I've just ground, this is the small corner relief I referred to and here is the band that interacts with the chuck body that I opted not to remachine. Also you can see here the interaction between the corner relief groove and the wheel. I pointed out not much corner wheel wear would be acceptable and you can see that if you did have much corner wheel wear because of how small this groove is, you could have left a lump which would have wreaked havoc with the interaction between this and the chuck body. So a nicely, nice sharp cornered redressed wheel guaranteed that I got a nice flat running and uh, the contact should be good. Well, Sherry o'clock is rapidly approaching and I don't want to keep Jefferson waiting so it's time for me to head indoors. I am nearly at the end of this grinding saga, just the chuck jaws to go, so you will see that in the coming videos. Apart from that, I'll say thank you for watching, I hope you found this interesting and see you on the next video.